All right, welcome to Thinking the Commons. Uh, I'm with Michelle Bowens and Alexander Bard. Uh, Michelle Bowens is a theorist of peer-to-peer -peer and commons uh, political economic organizations, and Alexander Bard is a philosopher and uh, also, in his own way, thinks uh, the commons and and commons. Uh, political future political organizations. organizations. And Alexander Bard. So I'm just going to give an intro to what I mean here by thinking the commons. Um, it's it's really inspired uh, not only from my own thinking on the commons. There's a, a paper linked uh, below in the description as well as a link to Michelle Bowen's work uh, and new project. Um, but also from a, from a paper that Michelle will be releasing later in the year um, that really talks about how we can think uh, the commons in the internet age, and also from a historical perspective. Um, when we think the commons, uh, what we mean basically is um, a form of action that is doing for the tribe, or uh, a form of self-action that is doing for the family unit, or, or a unit that is bigger than just the self. Um, in that sense, the commons is really an ancient form of political economic organization, and, and I think as Michel would argue, um, is really the foundation for exchange value upon which other forms of exchange value have since been built across time and history. Uh, so, for example, if you take the commons as sort of, you know, uh, a, a basic family or tribe unit, um, the exchange value there doesn't necessarily have anything to do with commodities or, or value exchange that you can get from commodities. Um, when we think about building on top of the commons, you can think about forms of value like gifts, exchanging gifts with each other. Uh, you can think about forms of value that have to do with status rank, like where I am in the tribe. Am I a professor? Am I an undergraduate? Am I a, am, am I just a, in grade five? <laughs> you know, these are different. These are different statuses within the within the tribe. Um, and then we can think about commodity exchange on top of that. You know, like where you, for example, think about uh, selling an online course, or you you know you, you put it on the market and it has a certain value attached to it. You know, like I'm going to sell this course for five hundred dollars or something like that. So these are different forms of value exchange. So really, when we're talking about the commons, we're talking about you might argue, and maybe Michelle will expand on this, but but you might talk think we're, we're talking about the really core of value exchange. And and, and I think one of the arguments that that many uh, political economic commentators have made over the years, perhaps especially on the left, is that the commodity form of value exchange has uh, eroded and become has eroded other forms of value exchange and has become dominant over other forms of value exchange. So basically, commodity value exchange becomes sort of like the only way we can think about value, uh, and in and in the process of that we we undermine and we don't think other forms of value exchange that are just as essential for our being. So, you know, when we think about the basic forms of value of a family or the basic forms of value of a tribe, you, you can't put a price tag on that. You can't put that on the market. There are things that you can't put on the market. And I think this is really one of the central ideas that we want to discuss here with the commons. And towards that, that point, um, we're thinking about the commons. Of course, we can think about it in the old tribe and in, in, in an ancient form of commoning, but we're also in the modern world on the internet dealing with new forms of commoning on digital networks. And this is really where Michelle is a founder and, and a pioneer uh, with, with peer to peer. Um, so we're thinking about new forms of commoning in the digital age. Uh, how to think this, it's it's really a new territory and, and it's difficult to do because of course, when we're on the internet, we're often disembodied like Michelle, Michelle, Alexander and I, we're not embodied in the same room. We might be sort of abstractly, um, you know, a part of some sort of loosely associated tribe, uh, intellectual tribe, but, you know, it, it's really difficult to think about what would a political economic system of the commons look like in this, in this new internet age. And that's, that's part of what we really want to discuss here. So I, I could go on a little bit more focusing on some of Michelle's work, uh, but I really want to pass it over to him so, so that he can, he can uh, dive deeper into this idea and, and we can really um, sort of think in new ways about about what a commons would look like today. So, Michelle, please um, 
yeah th Take thanks over. for inviting me and you know it's a great honor to be uh talking to you guys really uh very happy with this so maybe i'll just start with a, a few simple things for the people who may be listening to us and may not be familiar with the language so my early work was based on two authors one is alan page fisk who wrote structures of social life and this is a very boring 1000 page book where he analyzes in detail how people exchange value and he says there there are only four basic forms one is called communion of shareholding this is what we're talking about exchanging something with a whole give a brick get a house so you're not getting anything back from any particular person but you're you're using a common land a common forest and there's rules to use it things like that or the hunter of you know goes out to the hunt with a few of his mates he comes back it's not for him it's for the family and the clan it's it's a group it's like a common thing for the group um and according to the second book uh which was very inspiring for me which is Kojin Karatani struck um the structure of world history so he he kind of historicized he says commenting is first when we were nomadic but as soon as we settle and we can't flee conflict then we start with the gift economy in other words we pacify social relationships by gifting and counter gifting and that keeps you know that keeps friends between families and clans and tribes but that breaks down when you have conquest so once you have conquests and one tribe takes over from another you can say gift to me then it becomes you know taking and redistribution and that it calls authority ranking so you get according to your rank in the power structure. And today, as you said, this could be a PhD or something like that. So we rank people. And you earn more if you're a PhD than if you're an undergraduate. And then market pricing, which everybody knows. And so the idea is that there is a historical succession. And let me briefly say that we can kind of also stylize a history of the commons. So commons were, first of all, material resources, things we need to live together. And so very much physical resources, forests, uh, things like that, uh, with rules of usage. Capitalism is the first system which really systematically encloses the commons. Because you know the belief is that it's more productive to have private property and commodity exchange. So I think the second wave of commoning is really the working class mutual mutuality. So you have these farmers that get expelled from their lands. They, you know, they become proletarians in the cities. They die when they're 35 and in the 1850s. And what do they do? They socialize, they mutualize their, the risk of their life. You know, like uh, health, health clubs, fraternities. Uh, not that this was not done before, but this has become when it becomes a dominant form of commoning because the physical commons are being, you know, enclosed in the West. And this is statified this is our social security system so we privatize the land commons and we statify the social commons and that gives our you know our western modernity if you like i mean 20th century post-war modernity okay the third phase for me is then the internet when suddenly we discover that we can organize virtually peer-to-peer -peer in relatively independent of any physical territory and we create shared knowledge resources and that's when I came in. I, you know, I, I lived this. I, I, I was desperate about the neoliberal mentality. And then suddenly you discover, wow, we can work together. You know, we can share knowledge and, and we don't have to sell it to each other. And I think that had a huge cultural impact. Uh, and from then on, and I, you know, I think Alexander Barr is probably the, the primary thinker about this. From then on, we have a double world where we have the physical world, which still exists, we have an overlay of virtual communities and and you know people are now also self-organizing in a non-territorial way and this is the world we live in today okay this knowledge commons went back to the physical world so i did a study on urban commons and they grew tenfold from 2008 to 2016. so in ghent where i did my study there were 50 projects in 2008 and 500 in 2018 so this means that there's a layer of the urban populations nowadays that using the facilitation of these digital technologies are reorganizing their life they want access to organic food and they can't have it easily in the commodity sphere 
Well, they organize a consumer producer alliance called AMAP or community uh, well, uh, community supported agriculture. You know these kinds of things, right? Or they go back to cooperative housing, or they do car associative car sharing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this has been exploding, and I think we're now moving to the fifth phase, and we just published a book about it, it which we call Cosmo Local Production. So what is cosmolocal production? It's when you actually start producing physically, but using these digital networks to cooperate globally. And you know, outside of a multinational or, or because of course they already did that before, but in a kind of hierarchical and in, in the commodity sphere. Here what you have is an idea that we need to relocalize production in order to reduce the human footprint. So that's one motivation. That mutualization brings down costs substantially. So it's also a social motivation, you know, to live cheap, more cheaply than before, especially in the context of crisis. And it's a school of self-governance because commons by definition are governed by the communities that maintain them. Um, and so you have things like uh, the multi-factory movement in Europe. I'll just give that as an example. There's 120 of them. So these are artisans that produce with wood, metal, textiles, 3D printing, and they look for these abandoned factories, you know, in the outskirts of the cities, cheap rent. They organize some kind of co-op and they have something called the invisible factory. And that's where they do their collective projects as a kind of, you know, pan-European. I think for the moment it, it's only in Europe. So this is an example of cosmolocal production. In our book, we have 40 examples, which we detail. And, uh, okay, maybe that's enough, like, as a first, um, you know, kind of input so that people can digest it and maybe you can react to it. And you know, I have some more things to say, but I think that's like a, an overview statement, if you like. So this ties into uh, the concept of prosumption. Think of consumption and think of production. So prosumption is the dominant mode, actually, we're going to see, because we're now living in an increasingly interactive age. Uh, an example everybody knows about is, for example, Burning Man. Uh, right. There are now over 250 major spin-offs from Burning Man around the world. So they're much more important than Burning Man itself. This is one of the largest social cultural movements on the planet at the moment. We spend 10 to 11 months a year preparing for or summarizing and integrating your experience. And then you go to burn, or you may go to many burns in a year as well. And burns are interesting. The way Wikipedia is interesting because it's communism. It's actually practice communism. Even right. if it's communism for a luxury elite and only for eight days, something like that, it's still communism. You don't bring money, but you actually actively presume everything you get involved with. So there is no consumer left and there's no producer left in any of these chains. So I think if nothing else, I think presumption is going to happen anyway. It's going to, going to start statistically, nothing else. And once people get used to certain things and they have road models to practice certain things, uh, they start to mimic that. And once people start to mimic, it explodes and grows exponentially very quickly. And I think that's, I think prosumption is a good word here because then we're eliminating the old opposition between production and consumption in, into value chains. And we're actually looking at, you know, companies these days, they want the customers to be so enormously involved in the process, they want the cu customer to have an opinion about the product almost before the product is launched. Uh, they, they're dying for the consumer to, to recommend the product, to recommend the service to others because then they get good grades online and, and they get higher in the algorithms because advertising is dying, marketing is dying. Everybody knows that when a company puts out advertising, it's just spam. We hate spam more than we hate slavery these days. The, the abolition of advertising eventually will be a bigger victory for man than the abolition of slavery. I mean, if I would work with advertising these days, I, I, I don't know how I could survive. I'm just going to kill myself. That's how much we ha hate spam and hate advertising. So, so the, the, the fact that commercial corporations who live within the capitalist paradigm completely are trying to mimic prosumption speaks volumes about how much prosumption is going to dominate the mode of relationships between human beings. So that's happening already thanks to technology. And algorithms and blockchains make it easier for us to trust strangers which brings me to the other really important part here. And that is that human beings were originally nomadic. We lived in tribes and any size up to the tribe, the tribe was smaller than the tribe was clan and more, smaller than the clan was a larger family. Nuclear families never existed. 
So you know, a family was like maybe 40 people on average, a clan was 150 people, and a tribe would be something like 1,200 to 1,500 people on average. We all know from data anthropology that people are comfortable with these formats. We try to seek these formats. We start online communities. They usually operate at one of these sizes, right? You get really intimate at 40, you trust everybody. At 150, actually everything blows and it works really, really well. Then up to 1,200, there's still kind of a system of protection towards the outside world and a system of provision that's, that's almost automatically geared into a system of 1,200. Very tribal, right? The problem with our history, though, is that we only permanently settled a few thousand years ago. Most of us actually didn't permanently settle until like the last 50 years. And, and the problem with that is that anything that's larger than tribe is fiendishly difficult for us as human beings to handle and trust. And that means it's not only that there's a trade or, or there's an exchange of value between people that eventually in history starts happening on larger scales between larger populations. What's actually required before that is narratology, different types of narratives that can tie larger communities together. So the sort of narratives we tell our children are the ones that work for the family or the clan or the tribal size. But children can get them. You don't expect children to understand anything more than what they basically programmed biologically through instinct to actually be able to comprehend. But once as you get older, we are pushing ourselves to try to grasp things that weren't naturally born to understand, but actually through extended knowledge or trusting others or creating complex systems and technologies, we can therefore create larger populations with all the benefits and details. So, so say the, the first thousand years or so permanent settlements were basically constant warfare. They were probably the bloodiest periods of human history. And, and after that, we came to the point we needed a new narrative. And, and the narrative is essentially the first temples. It starts with religion. Religion is being developed from, from out of tribal spirituality moves towards organized religion. Organized religion is basically the organization of several tribes into one religion. That's fundamentally what religion is. And these stories, out of these stories, we create the first temple. So the temples are essentially, yeah, I walk up the stairs here, coming from one river valley, and you walk up the stairs over there from another river valley, and we meet at the top, and then we declare that two gods of these two river valleys have a shared ancestor, shared father. And this lineage that we claim, you know, the father god or something like that in the mountains, and then the mother goddess at the sea, and then there's a river flowing in between the two. And by the way, the two rivers here, between the two rivers, there has to be some kind of communication that avoids war as much as possible. We minimize the effect of war, it creates stability and peace. And because it creates stability and peace, we can create empires that have taxation, and all these kinds of systems, and that encourages trade. The traders are essentially people, hunters, who, who discover that instead of just hunting and killing, they could actually trade with each other around the temple. And around the temples and the trading posts, we have the first cities of history. And cities are much larger than tribe. And with cities come criminality and all kinds of other problems. And there has to be some kind of a membrane. There has to be a port where you have to walk through and have the right documents to be allowed inside the city. And obviously, if you're not being very beneficial to the city, you're thrown out of the city. It's nutrition in and shit out, right? That's what cities need to operate to be successful. And these very sort of sophisticated systems eventually become what we today call society. And they're larger than tribe, right? So what then happens is that we discover that if, if we share a narrative, if the narratology is shared, we can go for the mythical narrative, which is that we have a shared ancestor. We can go into a logical narrative, which is that actually we produce something here in this village and you produce something else in the other village. And if you barter between the two villages, we both gain from that. And eventually just using symbolic exchange added to that, which is money, we increase the efficiency of those systems enormously. And this is why the trade routes of history are still the most successful constructions we ever made. And the trade routes of history, we started the Silk Road, for example, you discover that there are some foundational commons at every trading post. It just makes better economic sense. So, so there are certain things that happen at the trading post. There are some commercial activities. You probably have to pay to stay in a hospital. You probably have to pay to go to a restaurant. You certainly have to pay to get inside the whorehouse not for the sex, but just for the enormous, fantastic social exchanges that are gone inside of there. They're later called nightclubs in history, right? And, and you have to pay to go into the bathhouse and clean yourself because there has to be hot water coming from a spring. It's also social place. And actually the moments inside of that is a social gathering. And eventually, after you're done the trade, you go to the bazaar. And the bazaar is one of these commons. The bazaar is a shared trading place with a certain regulated system, certain rules. Again, membranics. There's a membrane outside the bazaar. We don't let anybody in. 
if we allow you in, you've got the right papers and the right recommendations, and you're not going to make a fool of yourself. You're going to be a decently honest trader, trading against the other guys who trade the same goods that you do. And that's what a bazaar is. Bazaar is a commons. So that it's a commons, right? And after the bazaar, you probably go to some kind of spiritual center, cost talks, what we call them, we call them monasteries these days. That's where we clean your head from destructive thinking, like all the bad deals you did yesterday and all the people you hate and all that. You get that out of your head and you get a more constructive mindset. You can go to the next trading post and keep on trading. And again, that's a commons. So as soon, we all know that as soon as we have a shared commons, we have created the shared value and everybody benefits through the entire system, possibly. And because everybody benefits from that on top of that, we can then start trading and trade more efficiently. So even currency, for example, is common in that sense. So what is interesting today is to try to study, historically speaking, how the internet affects these systems. Uh, does it damage these systems? Does it damage them to the point that we might even go extinct? Or can it increase commons aspect of the systems? Since we know for a fact that the more of a commons foundation we have, the higher the overall value of everything within the system, including exchange hardware. Right, well, I think there's some issues here. Um, so one of the the articles I shared with uh, Cadell is that uh, something called the pulsation of the commons. Yeah. And, you know, it's a reading it's a reading of history that is based on the idea that markets uh, and states are extractive uh, institutions. They they're meant to grow. They're meant to make more profit, con conquer more land. And so, and they're they're in competition with their peers, with other similar institutions, and therefore they tend universally to overuse their resource base. And you can read history, you know, and, and there's books about that, like Secular Cycles from Peter Turchin and and uh, biophysical economists that clearly show, at least in agricultural society, there is this pattern about 300 years where you can see uh, these extractive. And then the other side is regenerative, right? So you have the people closer to the land, usually in alliance with spiritual reform movements, are saying, stop, we need to stop with this. We need to take care of the land. We need to take care of the people. We need to you know, be less corrupt. Um, and so these moments of history recreate common institutions which tend to degrade in the extractive periods because they're a rival to the state. And a beautiful example of that, uh, which you can read in Mark Whitaker's book, which is called Ecological Revolutions and the Actual Religions, is Japan. So in Japan, 16th century, you have a 100-year civil war. It ends with the shogun becoming the new emperor. And what he does is two things. First, he disarms the people, because that's what empires do. Empire disarm the local people um, and create peace within, within, within the borders of the empire. But the second thing he does, he nationalizes the pure land Buddhism commons, which is about one third of the land was managed by a rival to the state, which was this Buddhist church. But instead of destroying it, he keeps it as an imperial commons. And for 200 years, Japan is living in balance with its planet, with its regional planetary boundary. That's a fairly exceptional story, you know, that is kind of an exception to this pulsation. And that was destroyed uh, with the Meiji Revolution when they, you know, they they realized they couldn't continue like that. But this is a very interesting example of how the commons is a regenerative institution. It's the only one that we know that has historically been used to preserve life, the web of life, and natural resources. And so, what I would suggest, and this is what uh, Cadell wrote about in his nine, in his 2015 uh, essay which is you know the idea that right now we have a global crisis so we have a global overuse there's nowhere to go there's no frontiers to compensate for the overuse and so this brings the commons to the fore as a global agenda and the question is you know what kind of commons institutions can we build that can function a bit like you know what you write about alexander about you know the idea of a world state um, and I, I call it together with Robert Cohn and Ryan, uh, you know, the magis global magisteria of the commons. And let me give you just one example uh, of how this could work. 
So this is a uh, different groups. One is called r30.org reporting 3.0. The other one is called Global Commons Alliance. And they work on this idea of global thresholds and allocations. So imagine a institution like the WHO, but that keeps track of global resources. You know, there's so much copper in the world. We invent, we find new uh, deposits on average so much every two years. There's an X growth of productivity in the usage of copper. There's the biocircularity of 70%. So every time we use it, it's 30% less quality and in every iteration. And so this gives an idea to the whole world about, you know, is there a way to, to distribute the resources without competitive warfare? Right. Um, and yeah. so such an institution has to be uh, probably... Uh, interesting enough for you know nations and bioregions and corporations and cooperatives to want to join it because it's a guarantor of peace and it's a bit like your story about you know the the market uh, commons right you 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 need a commons for trade so that all the traders can trust the system and so this is a bit similar and I think this is the kind of thinking we need to do. Yeah, but I, okay. My my problem is a bit yeah. like my critique of Daniel Schmachtenberg, another guy who I love, the same way I love you, Michelle, like old friends. The problem is that this is the Soviet Union. This is creating these institutions that have global scope and must have some kind of a last word. Otherwise, they're not really powerful and they're not really institutions. And they cost billions and trillions of dollars to create. And they create bureaucracies that have no interest in maintaining anything but their own self-interest. I mean... We need to read guys like Michel Foucault again. We need to really understand the madness of power itself. We must not be naive thinking that the sort of organized state structures we're talking about here can ever be created uh, in, in a way that actually benefits humanity because they never did before. Why would they suddenly be benefiting I, humanity now? I, uh, my, my point, my point is this. Yeah. Yeah, I, but I, I would yeah, like to check. No, so no, you just finish, Michel, Michel, you just proposed something that's going to cost trillions of dollars to create. Let's admit that, Let's I, admit that, right? Yeah, otherwise, it's just boyish wishful thinking. We, we must be more serious than that. But, 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 but here's the point, here's the point. When we wrote the book, The Global Empire in 2003, we knew the title would be wildly misunderstood. We also had a best idea that. But we wrote The Global Empire from the point of view that in the future, some kind of AI would read the book and care for the world state would be a good idea from an AI perspective. I think that what we're looking at here is that eventually we go towards something called sensocracy, it's going to take a while because it must not be too costly or too centralized. But so Socrates is basically just a collection of data and data points from around the world. So you can have, for example, check on climate, how climate actually operates and stop guessing, actually know how weather and climate is affected or whatever we're doing or whatever the sun's doing, whatever you want. And the same thing goes with resources around the world. Because uh, we, can only, we can only create that kind of sociocracy when it's one, decentralized, and two, when data flows are so damn efficient, that could work. If you start doing it today and you start pulling in the, the World Trade Organization, the United Nations, you're creating a global fucking Soviet Union, nothing better than that. So that's the I, problem here. I, and I that's why agree. I believe in this set. But then you have, today, to me, you, have to, you have to give me the actual arguments. You're going to create your dream institution at no cost. All right, guys, guys let, me, right? Let, me, let, me, let, me, let me step in here for a sec. So I really like, one of the things I really like about... Um, Michelle's paper uh, that I was referring to in the beginning it, is this idea that he mentioned of the the pulsation of the commons, um, and, and I think how my how I interpret this idea of the pulsation of the commons is we have this ideology of endless progress. We have this ideology of endless complexification. Um, you know, you can see this in the modern sciences where the, you know, the main way we try to understand the human system is through complexity science, right? Uh, complex systems, um, trying to emphasize interdisciplinarity and, and so forth. But one of the interesting aspects that this misses and Michel highlights in his paper is that it's not just that our system gets more and more complex towards a teleological end point. Um, and, and this ideology was seen in the original Marxist doctrines and seen in the original sort of social democratic movements. There's also this weird polar flipping towards opposites. 
that we need to take into consideration. In other words, and I think this is missing in complexity science fundamentally, and 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 it's dialectical thinking. So it's it's thinking in terms of opposites, thinking thinking in terms of weird polarized reversals. Um, and, and I think that that what we're trying to get at with the commons is situated not only in this increasing complexity of our society, but that there's a type of paradoxical polarized reversal that we're dealing with with the emergence of the commons. So for example, Michel emphasizes in his paper that capitalism is in this extractive mode, uh, but that the commons is a kind of response to this extractive mode and sort of how I interpret it, and, and I also interpret Bard's emphasis on, on prosumption in the same way, is it, it's kind of like if the commons is the ground of, of ancient human organizations and you have value structures on top of that, uh, with, with capitalism being the most complex value structure on top of that, and that that most complex value structure of capitalism is becoming very extractive to the point where it's undermining its, its lower level. Here, Michelle, I'm, I'm thinking about a spiral like you, like you emphasized in your paper, right? Mm -hmm. Like a more of a spiral structure, which is always already at the same time. And, and so if you have the top value structure, which is extracting more and more, undermining the other dimensions of the spiral, we need a kind of opposite reaction to this extractive motion, which could be a type of commons, but it has to be a commons which we think of uh, in in an embodied way, not just the virtual layer. And I think that that was, was emphasized Absolutely. in your history, right? Because in your history, you were yeah. saying in the 90s, you were in the virtual, but now you're noticing this physical movement. So, so maybe if you could talk a little bit more about how you think about the pulsation of the commons and how you're thinking about the virtual and the physical. Right. So, okay. So, my proposal is nothing to do with central command planning top down. It's it's inspired by what we see today in the open source field. What you see in the open source field is a trilateral structure. So the core of the value creation is the contributive system where anybody can write code. Then there is a maintainer structure that, that looks at the quality of the code and accepts or rejects your code. But anybody can try to write the code. So this is where the value is created. The, you know, the common value is created in this commons. It's self-organized, et cetera, et cetera. But then you have a second layer. And that is that nearly all these open source communities have a institution. I, I call them for benefit associations because what they what they not do is saying here are our resources and here is how we're going to distribute them that would be command and control but they manage the infrastructure of cooperation what do we need so that is that everybody can continue to contribute and so they make peace between the companies the individual contributors the you know the governments that want to, uh, to peak uh, so they create kind of these mediating institutions that are called the FLOSS Foundation, the Linux Foundation, the Apache Foundation, the Drupal Association, etc. So this is the way to think about it. It's a global coordination. It's just that in terms of the physical integrity of the world, we need some clouds. And I, I, I'm honest, I don't know where that cloud will come from. But it cannot be purely voluntary either because your freedom stops where the survival of the planet is involved, right? So what? here's what I imagine, and I don't think that's command and control. It's a system of parameters that is integrated in your global accounting systems. And that, you know, that outlines for each individual or company in the system, its fear of relative freedom vis-a-vis -vis the system, the health of the system as a whole. So that's what I'm 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 aiming at, and I'm I, and the reason I I I I, I say this is because I see how it already works, in the open source. Area. Yeah. So, uh, let me let me finish with a, with a proposed power structure that is emerging in some cities. So the idea is the following: so we need to mutualize provisioning systems. So there's this movement called factor twenty production reduction. So, for example, you can have the same amount of commercial transportation in a city, 
and if you use electric vans and cargo bikes, you can do this with 5% of the energy that is currently expended for the same amount of commerce. It's just mutualization of the transport infrastructure. And so we can we can think about this systematically at the level of the city. So how do you do this? Well, you do this, and this is done in Italy. It's called the quintuple helix method. You have the city as a, as a coordinator because they know everybody. You have the commercial sector, the research sector, and the official NGO sector. Those four help the common centric ecosystems you know, to do their job locally. So how do you create a co-op, solidarity economy, a little company, an SME? And they help you do that. They, you know, they have the resources of the collectivity at, that they can use to, to help these initiatives. Okay, this is local. And you have exactly the same. So it's a kind of fractal organization. You have all the people doing, let's say, mutualization of transportation. You know, they don't have to reinvent the wheel. They have a global open design community, again, which is their commons. And their commons can be supported by fractally by a similar support coalition. This is nothing command and control. This is a, you know, it's a it's a bottom up cosmolocal coordination uh, system. This is what I'm proposing because I see the merging in real life. And it's not like saying, you know, there should be a central organization dictating so I just want to be uh, very clear about that. Uh, I, I am an anarchist, like, just like you, Michelle. I mean, at heart, we agree. Uh, the, the thing is, this, this, is a, this is like an old, old discussion, more interesting and, and actually more profound than ever. And it's how you take decentralization uh, further up the hierarchy. Because when we're looking at the hierarchy overall, you say, we agree that 8 billion people stuck on a planet. And there's a certain membranics involved that we just the planet itself. So while I'm not, I'm, I'm not r actually running after the term extraction the way you do. I think things, when they are too extracted, actually the prices do go up and they go through the roof. Uh, extraction is not, it's not the ultimate problem here. I think pollution is the problem, not extraction itself. Uh, but, but when it comes, we, we know now, we, we're moving into an age where actually certain things have to be agreed on and there has to be institutions of some kind that actually doesn't ruin life for us. We also need to lock up quite a few nuclear weapons pretty soon as well, probably. So we have we have these uh, existential threats that are for real. They now create the ultimate narrative with mankind as well. Any of the narratives have to include this aspect. But the problem is that if you're an anarchist, you love decentralization, you know decentralization works because it works. The closer you are to family, clan, or tribe size with human beings, the more they trust people around them and the more efficient their systems become. I think rather than looking at centralized options, which you have to do, if you go along your path here, which is what I then sarcastically call Soviet Union system, uh, what you could do instead is to look at actually what the internet actually offers here. Uh, what the internet actually offers is algorithms and blockchains. And if the algorithm and the blockchain is seen, there's two ideas here, two sides of the same coin. Explosive power of the algorithm and the blockchain together is that it makes it more difficult to lie than ever before. And capitalism's biggest advantage was actually there was so much lying going on within all human systems. Like you just went from one village to the next and started bragging about your product and you hyped it and you lied about it. Because you would go into the next village the next day. So you could, you could basically be criminal and then try to do trade. All traders were criminals, basically, if you could look at them today in hindsight. What capitalism forced you to do was that when somebody stood in the street corner and bragged about the product, you could just go up and say, yeah, but what's the price? Because the price for the product or the service would actually expose the truth, what you were saying. And in this way, capitalism was a brutal, phallic force throughout history that forced a lot of systems that were full of lies to actually become more truthful. That's exactly why these ideas of Asha in Persia, or Dao in China, these ideas that there's a way, there's a way to live in accordance with nature and culture and things around you, which is successful, which is basically to be truthful, long-term truthful. These ideas come out of the trade routes. These are religious ideas come out of the trade routes. And, and if we look at those ideas today, the algorithm blockchain here has fantastic potential. The way I describe it is this. The only, the only thing that we know for sure that correlates with economic success in the world today is how much you trust people around you. We know for a fact that people in Scandinavia and Germany trust on average five strangers, whereas in Nigeria you trust two. That means Nigerians work harder but are still poor. And probably in Russia, you get one out of five, and therefore they work even harder or die drunk when they're 55 or something. But we know that economic and cultural success rhymes with trust chains. And the potential of the algorithm in the blockchain is fantastic in the sense that the algorithms on the blockchain 
can create trust systems between people. So you could literally trust thousands of people you never trusted before because they'd be totally exposed to what you do in relation to you. And history will be locked. The blockchain does cruelly even lock history at every point in time. You cannot change this, this happened. Just a blockchain to prove it. And I these, love these, tool, these tools are my, this is my protopia, not utopia. This is my protopia. So rather than they didn't look at Schmachtenberg's and Bauer's hard work with different systems and institutions that must have global scale and therefore they become huge global institutions. And we're back with the United Nations, which I think anarchists should be better than. We should, we should try to do something much more centralized and start lower. I think it is much more a bottom up approach I'm looking at, where I think algorithms and blockchains and new technologies are absolutely key to be successful. And I, I, let, me, let me jump in here because I love this. Um, and then maybe make some connecting points to the to the paper I wrote in 2015, which Michelle referenced. Um, one of the central aspects for me that I was trying to get at with that paper is, is to totally get away from a positivist utopian vision of communism, because the reason why that's important to get away from, and, and Michelle mentions it in his paper as well, is that it doesn't really work with the negative or it doesn't work with absence. Uh, you know, what you can't see, you know, one of the things Michel critiqued in his paper was that leftist analysis focuses too much on material analysis. And this, uh, this, this prevents you from uh, paying attention to what you don't see. You know, I think this is really important. And, and, and one of the points I wanted to make in the paper was when I think about the commons, I'm thinking about it as a gap or an, or a lack, something that we lack, something that's not there. Uh, and at the same time, in order to sort of see the form of the commons, we have to pay attention to fundamental existential threats to the planet. Like, and those could be ecological threats. Those could be biological threats. Like a uh, coronavirus is a problem of the commons, you could say, for example. Like that's a very practical example. Coronavirus, it affects us all. We have to coordinate somehow. Whole sorts of political arrangements are being made about coronavirus, and and there's a whole bunch of discussions about do we approach it in the Chinese way, do we approach it in the EU way, do we approach it in the American way, and and all these different ways is we don't have yet a coordination system, you know, to really think about how we have a global approach to uh, commons problems. This could be technological problems, like for example, automation. Automation is something that will affect the commons. It will something that will affect affect everyone. So I'm thinking about the commons here in terms of basically lacks or gaps in the system that 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 are that are fundamentally threatening to our existence as a whole. So when we think about commons narratives, ultimately, like as Bard's saying, the narratology of the commons has to be in relationship to these global existential threats. And then one more point I want to make before passing it on to Michelle. Um, because I think like Bard was Bard was really uh, really nailing it with this this problem of trust and and needing local trust. I think this is so important to emphasize, um, uh, and that and that really one of the most intimate aspects of the commons uh, when you think about a family or a band or a tribe is that you trust the people there. And 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 one of the biggest aspects, and this is something actually I've been thinking about a lot more lately in regards to the mental health crisis, is that one of the reasons we have a mental health crisis is po possibly because we don't trust our, our neighbors. We don't trust people around us. Uh, and, and actually we feel as though we're embedded in a system of lies and, and lies and lying and untrustworthy actors have a horrible effect on our mental health. And, and I think that, that, that it, it ultimately undermines other systems of value like commodity exchange, like uh, uh, authority ranking, like gift economy uh, forms of, of sharing, is that if we don't have a commons where we can trust the basic people we're interacting with, and, and the crucial thing Bard mentioned was being truthful long-term. You know, to, if, if you're embedded in a network of people who are truthful long-term, you can trust those people with your life, then other forms of commodity exchange, other forms of, of value value uh, ranking um, will become much more effective and efficient in a way that's actually connected with our being. You know, the, the, the old Marxist distinction between use value and exchange value. You know, right now we have a system like with, and Michel emphasizes this in his paper too, with the 2008 stock market crash where exchange value is just so disconnected from use value, it's, it, it, it's, it's to the point of global absurdity. 
you know, so so I, I don't know if you want to go off that, Michelle, or 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 also respond to Bard, but those were um, some of the thoughts on my end. Well, well, just briefly, maybe you know about my approach. So, uh, I think we have to honor the institutions that humanity evolved over very long times, and so my approach is actually to to look at the state and the market and the commons at the same time, and to look at what what is best in each. And so the but I so the the shift the only shift I'm saying is that. The, I believe the commons should be central nowadays. And why is this? Because we need to preserve the long-term health of the planet. Uh, and that's new. Before we could you know, open a new frontier, we could move, we can't. So now we are at a situation where the preservation over generations of certain resources becomes a priority. And so in other words, markets and states have to be embedded in this higher commons logic. That's my point of view. So if you look at the relation between the commons and the economy, that means that the economy has to be generative towards the commons. Because what we have now is market forms that are extractive towards the commons. They destroy the commons. Like when you have Uber and Airbnb, you know, for example, Uber causes more pollution, not less. But, but normally mutualization of transport like that could actually dramatically lower pollution. But the way they design it as an extractive mechanism creates more pollution because all the drivers are always going around, you know, in order to find uh, a client. Uh, same thing with Airbnb. It's an extractive relationship. They, uh, you know, like in, in the center of Paris, uh, I think uh, there's only 15% of the people left. They, you know, people are just leaving because they can't afford. So the gentrification and speculation on top of that now, Airbnb drives people away. So, we need to think about market forms in terms of generativity vis-a-vis -vis the commons. How can we create livelihoods? But Misha, Misha, can I just interrupt that? Yeah. Can I just interrupt that? You're making very moralistic assumptions here. I, I, I'm I the guy so. who, I'm the guy who uses their Airbnb B &B apartment in Paris, and I bring three friends with me to see Paris. You see one side of the coin here. I mean, I, we can't. Uh, but we can, but, but, I, but, I, but I, I, yeah, yeah. Can, can we just it's, can we just a suggestion here? Can we just get the word extraction out of here and the sort of moralizing against capitalism? And start but Michel, the Michel, effect, Michel, is Michel's the effect is what the problem is. Extraction is not the problem. Pollution is the problem. No, I, I disagree. Okay. I disagree. Extraction let me, is a problem. Let, yes, let, let me go ahead. Let me let me try and mediate here because 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 actually, I mean, I I. I understand Michelle's point about Airbnb as an extractive mechanism because when when I'm using Airbnb, it's making everything way too expensive. I can't I can't afford I can't afford uh, basic rent. I can't afford uh, things like Airbnb. And I, I, the example I always give is the diff now and and here again I'm highlighting this as a, a problem, as a lack, as a gap, not as a not as a positive uh, a project. But Cattle, as, that's as, not true. That's just, simply let, let me let me let no, me finish. Wait, 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 wait. Airbnb raises costs in popular areas of the planet. Airbnb lowers rent costs in less popular places. It just makes the renting market more efficient. There's not more money around because Airbnb suddenly exists. You guys got to figure out your economics first before you start making this very more. Let me let me let me let me just let me let me just get let me just give the example I give to highlight a problem of the commons. Not again, not as a positive project, but if you compare if you compare Airbnb to couch surfing, you know Airbnb is a capitalist model. Couch surfing is not a capitalist model, but the problem with couch surfing is that it requires a lot more of the people using the platform and there are a lot more social problems with it. Like you actually have to be present on couch surfing. You actually have to, you know, sort of have a social exchange with someone on couch surfing. There are many problems about basic relationships between people on couch surfing that Airbnb kind of solves just because it's a capitalist mode of exchange. But I think that if we were to but really you have, you have, have fair bnb fair bnb okay uh, you know it's a market mechanism with the same advantages as the airbnb but doesn't have the disadvantages and so for example one of the rules is you know the original rule of airbnb was you know it's a way to rent your extra rooms and it creates an income for people who have extra rooms and have listen guys rooms. listen guys really Once, seriously you're too no. you're just two fiddle castros here right now this is getting embarrassing it is really getting embarrassing i thought we would discuss anarchists i thought we discussed this no, no, i'm not an anarchist you have that you uh, i you think are we are anarchists that. that's what you are when you love the commons because anarchism was always about trusting local and trusting trust and build from trust as far as you possibly could 
the CL for you to take it. That's proper anarchism. Is anything called anarchy? I'm talking about. I'm talking about anarchism. As I, I do believe, for example, Bart, and this is where you know I'm sure we might disagree on, but I do believe that, for example, you know, geographic territories will continue to exist, and there is a common good associated with the territory that requires its own institutions, and and those are, in my view. You know, you, you don't have to call them state institutions, but they're geographically based governance institutions. So I talk about generative markets and I talk about partner states. And partner states is a, you know, it's a set of policies that you develop at the local level, basically to increase personal and, so, and social autonomy. Um, I, I'll give you an example where the blockchain could intervene, actually, because, you know, I'm, I'm very much of the same uh, opinion that what the blockchain does, it, we go from an internet of communication to an internet of transactions and accounting represents the physical world. So that's, that's a, the big advantage of the blockchain is that we can now basically coordinate the whole physical economy to the digital. Um, okay. Um, and if you look at the accounting mechanisms, because let me continue on, on that on the blockchain, what you see in the blockchain is contributive accounting. So in other words, you have now the possibility to accept within the membrane certain agreed contributions as part of the accounting system. This is called contributor accounting. You have flow accounting. So the, the new types of uh, REA accounting called resources events agents do not have double entry. So in other words, classic capitalist accounting is autistic, you know, or maybe we can't use that word anymore, you know, but you know what I mean? It's like, it only looks at what's coming in and out of my entity as an individual entity. And now we can look at uh, externalities, positive and negative externalities. Um, and we can sit in a 3D dimension. So the new accounting REA systems don't have double entry, but any transaction is linked to the, to the ecosystem. Uh, and finally, this, term... this, is what, this, this is what's called sensocracy. We just add the word. Yeah, so word I'm method. coming to it. So the thermodynamic, the, yeah. the thermodynamic accounting, which is also being developed, is basically related to sensocracy because we can bring in those data. So instead of having a money, you know, which everything is in the price, but you don't really know what's in the price. We now can really see we have intelligent, intelligent crypto and we can have things like the fish coin. You know, which are domain-specific current cryptocurrencies that can manage the flow within a particular sector. Uh, so all this is becoming available. And so what's the best that planning can do? And so, for example, planning, why is it needed? Negative pivots. You know, we have certain resources. If we go under a certain threshold, it, it creates a, a negative uh, vicious circle. So we have to avoid to go there. And that's, that's what planning can, can, can bring. Uh, markets, intelligent markets that have added values uh, to the normal pricing. Uh, and then we have the coordination that we already have with open source. So it's it's a combination of those three, which I think will be the basis of a kind of, you know, an, an, ongo an ongoing next infrastructure. Um, I, I forgot your, your question, uh, Cadell, but... No, but I, I can just add here. I, can just, I get the idea, Michelle. The problem is that all these institutions are trying to pay the economy fees should cost them difficult to run. The reason why, there's no standard for how you measure things ever. Okay, you want to measure how much copper there's left on the planet? You can't agree because you have so many ways of measuring copper, availability of copper or non-availability of copper, uh, or what it would cost at a later stage in history to actually extract it, what kind of technology you would use, et cetera. The naivety here is that you think that you could measure things as easily as you seem to assume. And that's what this is just going to lead to conflicts of measurement. I would say that at the end of the day, when you start looking at all these sort of very big centralized, organized efforts to try to control things that human beings do, and have a huge bureaucracy, as I call it, Fidel Castro, Soviet Union, I'm sarcastic. We have huge bureaucracies that actually have a naive understanding and they have five-year plans of what you must do, and five-year plans of what you could produce and must not produce the next five years, and you end up with a poor society which actually doesn't at all interconnect with people in the market. It doesn't at all interconnect with what people want. The better way to do this is basically to say that there are certain things that can make your life. There are certain things that can pollute our planet at the moment. Tax them. Put taxes on them. So whenever you use them, it costs more. 
That means if you think extraction is a problem with capitalism, you just basically tax extraction until extraction has left capitalism. It's not capitalism in itself, it's that it's cheap to extract the problem. Capitalism itself is quite neutral. Capitalism actually is a force for truth rather than lie, to be honest about it. But if you have a problem here, you just tax it. And that's always why leftists walk in through the door. They were anarchists when they were young. They then became naive and they started creating institutions and they created Fidel Castro's Cuba, which is incredibly poor and not very free, right? And finally, yeah, they arrived. You're, 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 you're no, debating with some, you know, old style. No, 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 no I'm not saying it's you, right? So, uh, Michelle, Michelle. No, but I'm saying your ideas lead there. They lead to Stalinism. They do. The problem is not your ideas. The problem is the naivety of the act is based on assumptions that you're not seeing. It blinds part of the argument. You're creating new bureaucratic institutions. They cost money. And they actually, they just put a break on you. Institutions are... Money. Institutions are necessary, and this is very important. Yeah, but we, they must be minimal. Need... They must be minimal and not huge, right? They must I, be minimal. I've never said they have to be maximal. Actually, you know, what I'm proposing are global coordination mechanisms. Uh, and you, you and that does not require a large institution? It doesn't, no. You said you look global at, look... coordinates, right? Okay, guys, let's 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 listen and, and talk to each other. No, no, let's try to minimize interruption. Okay. So yeah. I, I want to I want to I want to just tr try to try to emphasize um, maybe some philosophical points that would would point towards some synergy between different points of view being expressed here. Uh, I think one of them is um, I, I, let me use the example of of Thomas Piketty's Capitalism in the Twenty First Century. It's it's an example I use in in the Commons paper, and it's sort of where I try to highlight or isolate the way he sees. Um, the problem of capitalism in the 21st century, let's say. You know, he, he was making reference to uh, a moment, a chaotic moment in the birth of 20th century um, uh, state solutions to capitalism in the Great Depression. Uh, this is, I think, what we often refer to as a Keynesian uh, social policies uh, and, and the emergence of the welfare state. And, and basically what Piketty's saying towards the end of capitalism in the 21st century is that we need some sort of global Keynesianism. And, and I think that like Bard's trying to emphasize is that we, we, we as leftists should be skeptical and critical of ourselves when it comes to big state solutions of global issues. And I think perhaps we all agree about that. Um, yeah, and I, I, I want to say something about that, Cadell. So, sure. so, the, the, so for me, the old left is thinking the same way as the old right, which is that value is created through extraction in the market. You know, if it's scarce, it has a price, you make a profit, you tax it, and then you redistribute it. So it's the market and the state. And I think we need to change the value regime. So, and the value regime is a contributory value regime. So if you look at an open source community, all the people paid and unpaid. So it's not commodity centric. It has a commodity sector and it has a non-commodity sector. And all the people that contribute create a common value of that particular open source resource. And, and then you have market players, they create added value on top of the commons. And then you have a kind of state-like institution, a false foundation, which maintains the peace and the, and the infrastructure. That's how it works. That's concrete, ex, you know, experimentally verified how, how it works. And so I think the shift is that we need accounting systems, we need measuring mechanisms which recognize contributions. And this is happening at scale already in the, in the open source communities. They have all kinds of mechanisms that you know, within, within the membrane say, oh, we recognize this as a value. And so you know, my friends, for example, of the Guerrilla Translation Collective, you know, they would, so people translate for free from English to Spanish or Spanish to English um, then some of them get, get jobs in the market, but they say, okay, the fact that we got our job in the market is because of our collective creation. And so 15% of the income is redistributed to all the people who have translated for free, right? So these types of mechanisms are, are legion in, in these uh, type of communities. And it indicates a, a contributory logic and impact pollution is an extractive uh, is a negative externality, is a negative contribution, right? So it's, it's within the system. Now I'll give you an example. So there is a huge community land trust in France 
what huge, it's all relative, 100 million euros in capital. But they already have a demonst demonstrated effect in uh, Bretagne and Normandy. So what they do is they buy up land, which is too expensive for young farmers. They put it in a trust and then they create an ecological contract. And so, you know, they can do organic farming. So they've calculated that they save the French state, its depollution agencies, like 360 million euro a year. And so here's the problem that, that we have in our society. We have no mechanisms except taxation and philanthropy to fund these extract these generative activities. So what I'm proposing is public ledgers, where if you have a public priority, you can say, you know, everybody who decarbonizes can lodge his decarbonation efforts, can have it peer very re reviewed. It gets tokenized and then either because it's a public priority or because big institutions are benefiting from your positive externalities, you can create systems which directly finance in a, in a virtuous cycle generative activities. So that's kind of, uh, you know, how you can start thinking differently if you move towards a contributive regime. And I, I want to say one thing, if you look at history, you know, whenever we had big transitions, and I think this is what's happening now, it was never business as usual, right? We, we have like when, when the feudal system, you know, comes after the Roman empire, it's not the same. It's, it, it has entirely different ideas and basis of how an economy works. It's a reversal because it's a reaction to the, to the failure of the previous regime. And so often we see history, you know, these dialectical reversals is that when a, a new system comes on, it's not just a continuation, you know, it will take over some things, but essentially it's a new logic operating. And I do believe that new logic is the contributive logic of the commons. And within it, we'll have still have the market logic and, you know, public authorities. And I'm, not opposed to any, I'm not opposed to any of this at all. That, that's the point. I, I think that commons have always coexisted. Capitalism itself is not opposed to commons. What often happens, for example, if I got a patent for a certain drug for 10 years, then it's left to anybody to compete with me after 10 years, and then it goes to the commons. So there are systems that actually could increase the power of the commons, which we should. I think it's a political issue. But what I want to take issue with Michelle is that I think Michelle is fantastic as a thinker of potential futures. And I think as soon as Michelle's ideas can be implemented at low cost and efficiently, they get really interesting. I would say as things are right now, we're at right now with decisions we need to make, I would make other priorities. And the way I basically put this forward, using Michelle's language, is that I said, if taxation and philanthropy work, let's start with taxation and philanthropy. And let's work with taxation and philanthropy because we know they work. They work for several paradigms already. And they seem to work. Whereas creating new institutions, I think, is much more difficult than Michelle describes it here. And also it's so much costlier. You, you, you yeah. can experiment, uh, you know, and that's the important yeah, and thing. I, I, I'm to experiment. We are collaborating, with, Michelle. We are collaborating. We are public, collaborating. Yes, we are. Also with public not. policy, we need to experiment. Because I, I think yeah. the issue is that, you know, and so let's take open source production as an example. So we are moving away from what I call, you know, Marxian capitalism, where labor is a commodity and people are paid for their labor and then profit is made as a surplus, if you believe in that theory. Okay, maybe not, but I, I think there is a, some truth to it. And once we move to peer production, to commons-centric production, what happens is that we have a system, let's say, let's take Linux, where 75% of the people are paid and 25% of the people are not paid. And so... As this system is evolving and growing, and it is exponentially growing, what we get is a value crisis with more and more people performing free labor and less and less of that labor is being bought as a commodity. Take, think Facebook, you know, which is huge, but it only has a few thousand people in its employ compared to a car you know, company, which uh, actually now has a lot less value, but had you know needed 20 times more people to function, right? And so this, this is an issue, I think, with a, within a capitalist regime, because we thought, and I don't know what you think about this, but, uh, but uh, uh, we thought that we would go to a knowledge economy. And what we're discovering is that only a very small part of the knowledge can function as a commodity. Most of it is actually a commons, or at least, uh, you know, a common pool resource. Um, 
And so we, we have a serious issue in that more and more people in the West are precarious and are not getting yes. paid for all the extra work they are doing. You know, like uh, like typically an Uber driver, which is sitting down on you know uh, half of the day and is not getting paid for it, and then he's only get, getting paid when he when he moves his butt. Uh, and so these these systems are increasingly common and create a real structural issue for you know market based state taxed capitalism as we used to know it. And that, that's why I think why Keynesianism wouldn't work. Same thing with. Yeah. Um, you know, I get frustrated with this proposition of a shorter working week. For people like me, it doesn't mean anything. Yeah, like, exactly. You know, I'm going to work 90 <laughs> hours, 90 hours a week, and then I'm going to go away, you know, when I want for three weeks somewhere, right? And so it's more like a lifestyle of a, of a like an actor. You work very hard when you have a movie. It's the old then, ideology. You know, yeah. But so tell me like a shorter working week, it doesn't mean anything for the kind of workers that no. I and probably you represent. We are no. we are not no longer that paradigm. And at, and at the same time, the things you're pointing out to me, I think are 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 so so essential with the I mean you could use examples like Facebook. I remember seeing a really funny meme about the difference between Kodak in the 1990s and Instagram in the in, in 2010s with the number of workers Kodak needed versus the number of workers Instagram needed. And these are incre like, or like there's all, all, oftentimes very funny memes about Amazon factories that are just totally automated. And you could have a completely distributed network of totally automated logistical uh, uh, relations. You know, th this is a problem to me of the automated commons. And I, where right. at least that's what I pointed towards in, in the paper is that if you have logistical chains, if you have transportation networks, if you have all sorts of foundational global coordinating mechanisms that are for the most part automated, you're going to need some people in the sort of process. But for the most part, you know, again, the example of Instagram or Facebook or Amazon, where a lot of these things are automated. How do we how do we distribute the value that's created from that? And well, I'm not here, saying here's a state yeah. solution, but here, here's the problem. We all know that I proposed an idea over 20 years ago that said that capitalism was dying, was replaced by attentionalism. Okay, very few people actually understood what attentionalism means. And we live now in an attentionalist society. And you and I can now, we're involved in several networks and Michelle is too as well. We're trying to now define what attentionalism actually is. I would say the first problem with attentionalism is that since it's not capitalism and it cannot be bought or sold, <laughs> the problem is that it doesn't generate income for people either. But attention right. is what we're obsessed with these days. Uh, and, and advertising doesn't work. Marketing doesn't work. I'm very happy about that because, you know, corporations finally now have to make products that we actually want. They have to make the best possible product at the best possible price. And nothing else pays off on Google Maps. Nothing else pays off the algorithms. That's good news, right? The bad news is this, is that we spend most of our time creating or trying to redistribute attention or something with each other. And that is not a trade in the regular sense. I refuse to use the term detention economy because it's not an economy. Just like Michelle said, this is not a knowledge economy because it's not an economy. Knowledge and attention are not economies. That is the problem. And that's what we spend most of our time on these days. And that's what these issues had to be radically now embraced by philosophy. Because we're actually living in a society we haven't even defined. So with knowledge and attention, should we be thinking in terms of a commons? Knowledge and attention commons. Is that, does that make well, sense? I think, well, I, think, the, I think it is, but it doesn't pay your bills. That's the problem. I think that's well, exactly what it is. Th yeah. There's two ideas that I can present here. So one is the basic idea of the basic income, but interpreted in a commons way. And the idea of a basic income in a commons way is that, that civil society has become productive. We, we can no longer say that only the market is productive or of the state is productive. Civil society networks are productive. Networks of citizens are productive. And therefore, we could say, and this is an, an, a common centric argument for the basic income, that every citizen, by virtue of being a citizen, contributes to the common good. And that would be a moral justification for basic income. Uh, you know, not as a handout, but simply you're, you're a citizen. We know you, you know, your, your, your life and your presence is good for uh, society and therefore you know, we give you something. And that's kind of a basic, uh, that would already help, I think. And from a very selfish position as a commoner, I think a basic income, I, I meet a lot of people that say, I would like to do this and they can't because of, you know, their, their all kinds of material issues that they are facing. 
So I think that having just, you know, uh, an amount, a basic income amount would help a lot of people in, in, in transitioning to more generative and more passionate engagements. And they would be willing to do a sacrifice and earn a lot less than in the market, at least for a while until, you know, they get their act together in these uh, uh, other activities. Another idea is from Yanis Varoufakis, which I think makes a lot of sense too, which is the idea of a uh, basically a secondary income. Uh, you know, this, this comes from the 1930s, it was called binary economics. And the idea of binary economics was that you get a, a wage from the market and you get an income from the commons. So, for example, now we have the sovereign nature movement, which you might be familiar with. So the idea is you take a forest, you turn it into DAO with, you know, sensors and everything, uh, and you give it agency and power, just as we do with corporations. So DAO can say, Okay, it has a sensor, it can see when there is overfishing or overgrazing or whatever. You know, it can it can hire a lawyer. But the, th the here's the key point, it can have an income and it can pay the people who contributes for its upkeep and development, right? So imagine a society where land can be a commons, right? So the, the, the all the the speculative uh, growth uh, could go there. So that's the idea of Yanis Varoufakis, is not to start with a basic income, but to start with the creation of commons that over time create extra income and would accumulate, um, you know, in the life of individuals. So, I mean, I, I don't know if that will work, but I just want to share with you the the kind of yeah, ideas yeah, that are circulating. It's, it's yeah, a bit I know, speculative I know. at this stage, but... yeah. My problem with basic income is basically nobody's ever prepared to pay for it. I want to know who pays for it before we even discuss it. And the other problem is that a lot of these ideas are beautiful, but they're thought in a very conservative way, the very Platonist. So the idea is, for example, oh, we have a forest here and we want to keep this forest forever. It's like, how do you know whether that forest actually benefits mankind or anybody else 50 years from now? You can't know that. But we're moving towards very conservative ideas. And it's nice, we need to conserve the planet, but we then go from conserving the planet, which means we can still be around, to conserving everything we find on the planet as well. And that is what I called uh, eco-fascism in the sense that it, it, it's just, it, just, it just makes an excuse that, oh, because the planet is dying, or at least we can't live on this planet longer, we can now excuse just about any conservative idea, which is conserving, 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 conserving. When we know for a fact, that one of the problems actually right now, especially in Europe and North America, is a huge bureaucracy. They prevent us from building the very things that we put on the planet because people want to maintain things as they are. For example, there was no connection between organic farming and saving the planet. Because organic farming is more damaging to saving the planet than anything else. So there's so many of these ideas that sound good but aren't really anchored in reality. And that's what I'm looking for. Those are the really fantastic ideas that I find. And this is why, for me, it's still algorithms, blockchains. It's still examples like Wikipedia. You mentioned other examples of lines before. We know the commons work. I'm going to go shopping in an hour and I'm going to buy steak in a corporate uh, shop or, you know, benefit or whatever the shop does goes back to the consumers and the producers. I mean, we have these systems already. Capitalism was never opposed to them. We could all create let, them. Let, and let, and we should encourage me, more of them. Yeah. Let, let me give you a nice example of, you know, how things could be done. And this is a real example from, uh, from Rio de Janeiro. So there is... Um, Two executives from a coffee company who were not happy with the fact that the primary producers of coffee were basically starving um, and everybody else was making money but the people growing the coffee were not and so they asked the question can we make good coffee without uh, impoverishing the the producers of the coffee and he, so here's what they did so they said okay let's make everything open so if you go to Curto Cafe, you can see where they get the coffee from, from which farmer, all the details, everything is totally transparent. Then they produced a, a machine, uh, uh, how you call it, to roast the coffee, um, a distributed roasting uh, coffee so that the farmers could roast their coffee themselves. And this quadrupled their income. Okay, then they created a um how do you call it a crowdfunded retail expansion strategy they so they simply go to their community of coffee lovers and they say okay do you want us to be present in this shopping mall and have a store there and it costs you know four four thousand dollars a year or whatever and so people 
crowdfund the, the rent and they get their money back in coffee. So they get uh, free coffee, basically. Okay, then they open the store. They have a poster outlining all the different steps and why the coffee costs as much as you know they ask for. But they actually don't ask for the money. You, anybody pays what they want. You know, they get a, a jeton, uh, a little fake uh, plastic money. Uh, and they have no personnel because they don't need it for the money. Uh, and so when I went, it was one little store. And I went back three years ago and they had like two huge uh, hangars uh, uh, functioning. And they were starting with coffee, uh, with chocolate and cheese uh, on an experimental basis. So why am I telling you the story? Because in this ecosystem, there's no producers, there's no consumers. It's an ecosystem of all the people uh, that love produce and use coffee um, as a tribe, you know, uh, really organizes a tribe. And this was before the blockchain. And what I think that is happening with the blockchain, and especially with, you know, projects like Common Stack and Economic Space Agency. So these are blockchain incentive systems that are trying to merge the Ostrom you know, commons rules, the eight rules of the Ostrom uh, rules, uh, and to bake them in in the regular in the re rules of the of the commons. So it's still experimental, but you know they're trying uh, quadratic voting and quadratic uh, funding. Um, and so here's maybe just to end, like what I think is important. I think that every competition for scarce good leads to concentration oligarchy. So that's that's inevitable. But I think what we can do is, and that's what cities in the Middle Ages did, the free cities and the guild cities, is we can create counter-oligarchic protocols. And what that, it's a bit like taxation, if you want, but the, the idea is you cream off regularly, you know, some of the top and you recreate a broader basis, a distributed basis, so that the system can continue without, you know, dying from uh, pure monopolization. And so I think we can embed those things in our digital systems um, and that would probably, you know, can create these longer term viable systems. But I don't think you would, yeah, you wouldn't design AI any other way. It, it, it doesn't make perfect sense. I mean, we, 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 we broke the big trust, for example, the North American economy, late 20th century and late 19th century. It should have been done 100 years later, but it wasn't done. And so monopoly, nobody benefits from monopoly or an oligopoly for that matter. We all know that the more decentralized the market is, the more beneficial, beneficial it is for everybody at the end of the day. It's just how markets work. I think these things, we know quite a lot about these things. I just want to get the naivety out of the picture. But anything else that works, if something works, that's best practice. If it works yeah. today, if it works best practice in tribal, that means that a community of people say, a community in Brazil did this and it no. worked. You do the same thing in Finland, you, right? Yeah. And then you would do the yeah. same thing in Finland because as soon as anybody on the planet these days practice something using these new new tools that we have, the algorithms of blockchain, part of that mix, anybody use something that works, and other people around the planet are mimicking it instantly because it becomes a story that we're interested in. I just want to. I just want to emphasize. Um, I just want to emphasize, and you know, th thanks for thanks for describing that, uh, Michelle. But I, I just want to emphasize Bard's point about um, getting the you know the problem of getting naivete out of the system. I think it's I think it is really important. You know, I, at least that's that's my first response. Not necessarily um, to the examples uh, you you were you were giving, Michelle, but just in in general, whenever I'm trying to organize some practical. Uh, local project, and it, it involves money, it involves people collaborating, involving real economic processes, there is always this problem of naivete. And, and there's something um, a, co a collaborator in my Freudian unconscious group said when we were thinking about building a, a commons guild around intellectuals, um, you know, basically trying to break away from the tenure track model uh, and getting into building a guild around certain intellectuals and sort of rethinking how knowledge and attention is 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 used for you know people who would be professor types, and and, and the first thing um, uh, his name's Eric Job and and the first thing he said was the problem for all of these things will be the the real of economics and by that he sort of meant the way in which the real of economics creates so much uh, emotional negativity 
uh, in regards to the people collaborating. There's always problems in that regard. And so I, th I think that getting the naivete out of the system is, at least for me, and I, I'm, not an I'm not an economist. I just want to emphasize that I'm not an economist. So uh, at least the, the only way I can sort of approach these problems uh, as a personal individual in the system is by constantly reflecting upon um, sort of the ways money always gets in the way of, uh, of personal relationships, uh, the way in which our personal relationships are always disturbed by it, the way in which it always brings up the most emotional problems. And, and, and I guess that's maybe in some sense what, what uh, led me to psychoanalysis was because I was constantly trying to critique and constantly trying to reflect on how uh, my very personal relationship to money was getting in the way of my possibilities to collaborate with others. I don't know if that resonates uh, with either of you, but but um, it, again, trying to get this naivete out of the system is very difficult. Right. I so you know one of the things that because you know I'm I'm myself very conflicted uh, around my politics for the moment. Um, uh, but, you know, when I left the left for the first time, that was when I was in my 20s and I, I, I was a Trotskyist back then, uh, you know, it was really because I thought, you know, they're, they're Rousseauian, right? They, they really believe, and I believe, that, you know, if only that evil system would go away, then people would be naturally happy and, and working together. And I really thought that had disappeared. For a long time, I thought that, you know, we had a left, which was kind of like, more realistic and and you know uh, realize the contradictory nature of the human and you know we have good sides and bad sides and selfish sides and altruistic sides and it's all a big mix and personally I believe pretty much in multi-level selection theory as as a good explanation of why you know we are both um, but of course what we see now especially with the woke movement is that we are back in a you know mega Russo uh, uh, ideology except that now the bad is 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 ra is racially defined or gender defined but it's the same thing and 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 so in that sense you know that i appreciate more conservative people now because they have this sense of realism that i uh that i miss uh, with some of my older friends and you know i was watching the rittenhouse affair and 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 the covington boys and it's very systematic that you know if you believe the liberal press you have a completely completely wrong image of what happened it's like almost the total opposite of, of of the factual basis so that is i think a sociological problem now is that we have again a, a massive uh you know uh, growth of these uh, idealistic uh, visions of the world and you know maybe bart is right and i i still have a lot of them myself but i just want to say in my defense maybe that you know the philosophy of the p2p foundation wiki is really it has to exist before it gets in so all the examples that i base my theories on are really existing projects you know sometimes they're experimenting and they fail later but essentially i no longer believe in oh things should be one way or another it's it's i want to look at you know the the tens of tons of flowers that are blooming as we speak or people are trying to solve their problems and my theory of change is related to that. I, I think that when an old system is disintegrating, and I'm sure Bart will agree with that, you use the same, uh, even the same language, you know, the exodus, right? Uh, slaves become serfs, serfs become labor. Uh, you know, Roman slaveholders become uh, feudal lords and feudal lords become bourgeois, right? You have, you have this uh, exodus from one system to another. And now it's the salariat becoming the precariat and the precariat are the commoners. They have to be networked to survive today. They are networking all the time, and they're no longer in the same physical space. But they create all these networks in order to thrive I, and survive. I just want to. I just want to re-emphasize how much I like the term precariat. Uh, I, I think it was. I correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it was Guy Standing who first proposed the, the word precariat. And I just think that that term is important because when we think about the proletariat, I'm thinking, I'm thinking this is important for leftist politics because when the we use the term proletariat in the Marxist sense, you're thinking about some sort of um, almost like a, 
a, st a strong unified working force that are like powerful and they, they're going to take over the world. But precariat is a much different notion. It has a much different connotation. And I think that it's essential for commoning because it uh, brings about a notion of vulnerability that actually I'm vulnerable. I'm, pre I'm in a precarious situation. And it's from actually being open about your vulnerability with others that could open the door for types of commoning. Yeah, and that's exactly what is happening. You know, imagine the, the the people who came to the medieval cities from the countryside and they came in a situation where they had no protection. And that's when the guilds, you know, in 70 years uh, from uh, 975 onwards, we had a explosion of guilds, uh, like thousands of them in Europe in, in a very short time, including agricultural uh, commons, you know, as, as contracts. Um, and I'm you know, I'm working and I'm a member uh, of smart.coop, which is a very interesting organization. And we talk about autonomous workers. So we have this system and I I think it works really well. Is Okay, so you join them as a, as a member. You're a cooperative member of the organization. So you are totally free to take on any employer, any project you want. You get paid. But then you have a second account. So you're commercial account goes into his salary account, right? And they have these algorithms to exactly determine how much you should be putting in your second account. With that same second account, you become an employee of your own co-op. And therefore, you have a salary, you have security, and you have the advantages of the welfare state. And so you have your freedom to operate as you want, you know, follow your passionate engagements and find clients or whatever, and at the same time, you have the brotherhood and the security of being in a co-op. And I think those kind of solutions is what we're going to build nowadays. And I keep track of them. It's, I have a session called P2P Solidarity. You know, and there's already wonderful solutions coming out of this. And, and so we have to look at what I call common fare. You know, welfare is the old system. And of course, I'm not against it. I, I think it, there's some very good things about it. But it still carries a notion of kind of top down, you know, the state as the and then the consumers who gets the support. And so this idea of common fare, uh, I think, is more attractive because you have this active element of the precariat self-organizing and creating its solidarity systems. So I don't know if Bart agrees with this, but I, I I'm oh, yeah, I've got a word. I've got a word. I've got a word for it. A prosumptariat. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> not a right. prosumptariat. <laughs> we call yeah. it, we talk about presumption. This is a class that recognizes yeah. the competition is the teacher. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think this is what we're going through right now is, that, you know, there's an explosion of these uh, experimentations and these seed forms. So the way I see it is at some point, you know, the old system crumbles and then people will look, where do we go? Where do we go? Right. And well, OK, we can find a warlord and become a serf or we can go live around a monastery, which is a bit safer. Um, and now we will go look for maker spaces, co-working spaces, all kinds of arrangements which are being experimented as we speak. And, you know, I see them as potential seed forms that will first create subsystems and then subsystems linking to each other create uh, uh, an emerging meta system, which we, you know, we can't fully predict. But I think if we carefully look at what is happening, we can say quite a bit actually of, you know, potential future futures. Um. I think, let me, let me jump in here for a moment to offer um, perhaps a philosophical point that will be interesting for, for the viewers. And that's, and that's the philosophical difference between Marx and Hegel, because we all know that we, I mean, I think most people are probably going to be aware of Marx's philosophy. We understand that his dialectic was situated between a primitive communism and a world communism. And he was pointing towards sort of a moralistic uh, teleological necessity, what should be. Uh, and, and Michel, you were emphasizing that you're no longer focused on what should be. You know, I think that 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 in Hegel, we have the opposite tendency, which is not for thought. And this is a relationship between thought and being. In other words, in Hegel, it's not that thought can know what being will be ahead of time. Thought cannot know what being will be ahead of time. In other words, it can't jump ahead of itself. 
So the role for thought in Hegel is to sort of remain dialectical and observe like what you're saying, the seed forms of the present and sort of try to sort of sort of see the the emergent logic of the developmental form, the seed form itself. But we don't yeah. know what we don't know what the seed form will be. We, we can't say what it will look like in 2030 or 2040, but we can sort of see that the seed form has a, a different developmental logic. It's a new logic. Right. And sort of we participate in the creation of that. Like, and the reason why we can't know it ahead of time is because it involves our own subjectivity. Yeah, but I, I think that you know an insight in the seed forms can can stimulate imagination, right? It can, it can, and you can learn from others. So it's all those patterns. And I'm sure you're familiar with it, you know, this idea of a pattern language, right? This is something that is also growing everywhere. So, you know, I, even the Salesians, I, I met a Salesian and they have the Salesian pattern language. And so the idea is that you systematically look at the patterns that are emerging and you describe them in a, in a formal way. And then you get this library of patterns. And then with the, within the whole commons, you can learn from each other and look at the patterns they're using elsewhere and they become like common knowledge. And I don't know if you can verify this for me because I can't. I, I looked for it, but I, I read something and I... And I didn't bookmark it to my shame, which is uh, that we are learning eight times faster than 20 years ago. I think that would be very interesting to verify because, you know, as we have these huge, huge problems, I think the capacity to learn faster is something that I think is important in transition. You know, right? to know that when things can, go down, that is also uh, like the solution I, I, space. I, I would I would add that if we learn eight times faster, we probably name drop 50 times faster than we did 10 years ago. And we know on the deeper level a lot less than we did 10 years ago. So that, <laughs> okay, I, I, I would like to look and measure that. Because I don't think 90 year olds today are any smarter than a generation ago. They just use Instagram 10 hours a day. No, not, as, not as individuals, <laughs> but as collective, okay. maybe. Well, certainly with the machines help. Yeah, because if the machines have said as a library, so we include the libraries. Have no, a I, I'm, I'm thinking, I mean, this is a really bad example, but they looked at, uh, you know, um, IEDs, you know, the, the the bombs that are used. And it took the original uh, Taliban's, it took them like a year and a half to get the hold of it. And now when a, when a civil war starts, they, they after three weeks, they can do it. You know, so there's the yeah. kind of, like all the plans are there, they know who to ask. And th this is where the networks, I think, play a role in, 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 in much more rapidly, you know. And think about the woke movement. I, I don't think there is any social movement that has gained hegemony so fast. I, I cannot find any movement in history, you know, which has moved so fast to take over the ideology and the control oh, oh, no. of the situation. I can, ex I can, ex I can explain that, Michelle. I can explain it because they only attacked the old institutions that everybody else was leaving. They, they went into politics, they went into mass media, right. they went into academics, they went into precisely those places that we are leaving. That's why it happened right. so quickly. So it was a big void, it was just a big issue, so boom, it was right. right. And they then filled with the mediocrity, they filled these institutions, because those institutions themselves are not mediocre and active. So that's I, really funny. I, 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 is, I, it's very similar to what I, happened I, in France in the 18th century as well. Yeah. The Jacobins were the same thing they did. Right. I just, I just want to, I just want to say maybe it's, it's, uh, yeah. I mean, maybe we go down the rabbit hole of woke for for a moment. Uh, maybe it takes us too far away from the topic of the commons. But I, I do, I do remember uh, when I was an undergrad. I remember sort of seeing, you could say, the seed forms of woke in my in my undergraduate uh, classes. And I and I remember thinking, there's no way this is going to become a thing. I was like, I was remember, like, there's, it's like, there's no way. This is so silly. And what then, else? What else did you think that the institutions or the old political left would do when the workers didn't want the revolution in the 1980s and that was over and done with? Socialism was left without an ideology. And what basically happened here in Scandinavia, where I live, is that you had so many bureaucrats who needed a new ideology that they picked up feminism and LGBT rights and things, and then completely perverted them. I mean. Nobody is feminist any longer if radical feminist is the thing. Nobody is an LGBT activist any longer if an LGBT person, because the LGBT people have left the LGBT plus movement and taken over bureaucrats. That's what happened. That's and true. now also, of course, from the right, it's even worse. Because from the right, corporations are trying to buy into woke desperately because they're fucking 
commercial departments, their marketing departments have nothing to say about the terrible products any longer, except yeah. trying to make their products look well. It's just, it's just a yeah, terrible, I, I, right? I want to share. It's the, it's the end of a paradigm. That's what it is. It's very much Jacobi. Yeah, uh, it's, a, it's, a civil, it's, a civil, it's a civilizational autoimmune disease. And yes. uh, I, I've been looking at, you know, the the end of the Roman Empire and, and uh, uh, the books by Eric Vergelin. And, you know, he has some really interesting uh, historical descriptions there. And, and so one is, you know, explaining how the Christians got strong. And that's interesting by itself. So basically, you know, they were better organized and they cared for the people. So when you had the plagues in the third century, uh, you know, th th they did much better. And that, that came to the attention of the emperors who were looking for like a legitimacy for their imperium. And so eventually anyway, so they became strong. But they also were responsible, at least according to the pagans, for the, you know, for the, for the destruction of, of Rome because they, you know, they they defunded the cults, the civic cults. And so there was a huge demoralization um, in the Roman heartland that led to the, the invasions. And so I'm, I'm seeing work a bit in a, in, a, in a similar light, except that they don't do anything constructive and positive. That's why they're so the comments. They're not a yeah. comments. They're what I but would call them. I, I want to share with you, yes. I want to share with you my kind of, you know, I, so I've been canceled in 2018 and I've been a kind of a political impasse because you know, my idea was very much inspired by the 19th century labor movement, right? You, in other words, you start commoning, you you start commons, and you you build them, you construct them, and you know, before you know it, you have this kind of uh, smorgasbord of commons in in every field, and and then of course you create links, and you know, it's a bit what the labor movement did with its corporations and mutuals and fraternities, and became very strong. And uh, you know, what I've seen is that. There's a, you know, almost all of my friends in the progressive community are becoming woke. And it creates an enormous tension in these organizations. They basically destroy the organizations. Uh, now, the commons itself has a bit of um, immune system against this because, you know, if you're contributing to a common project, I can't give you anything because, you know, of your race or gender. You, you have to contribute. That's the basis. So it has a bit of a, you know, it's, it's called it. Yeah, it's called a duocracy. It's a beautiful word. Yeah, Unless it's a you do something so you don't know about. The, it, do right, so like, it has like, this kind of immune yeah. system. But yeah. I still believed until recently, and it was true, because, you know, pragmatically speaking, that, you know, red-green coalitions were, like, the most friendly to development of commons policies. And I got invited to Ecuador, and I got invited to, to Ghent to do some work. And so generally speaking, and so what, what, what is happening now is that because of, they're going more and more woke, is they're losing working class support. And the working class is going to the populists. And I see two, two options there. One is the Anglo-Saxon option, which I don't think is a good one, because they're too libertarian. So Trump, for example, you know, did a tax, a tax reform which, which gave three trillion more to the upper classes. That, that is not good. Uh, but the Hungarians and the Polish, I think they're more clever. They're creating these class coalitions a bit like the Christian Democrats did 50 years ago. So they have another solidaristic elements to it to create more stable uh, political support. And here is my controversial analysis is that I think what the woke left is doing is spiritual annihilation. I think it's total you know, spiritual emptiness and, a, and an attack on people's dignity. Uh, but the right wing doesn't care about either ecological or social justice at all. So you, I looked at the Zemmour phenomena and, you know, only 12% of his voters care about these issues. And I, so, you, you know, so you see what I mean. So we have one force, which is absolutely terrible to have a life in, in this kind of society, but the other you know, just it's just totally blind to any of the material issues of the planet. So that's that's my political impasse, and so I I, I don't know how to overcome it. I well, think we should also like the there's, there's a woke right, yeah, but there's a woke right as well. But that's corporations just killing themselves by trying to go political. Yeah, yeah. They should never have gone political. Yeah, there's there's so, woke capitalism. They, and they, there's, they deserve to die. They deserve to die. I don't have a problem. Yeah, there's, with that at all. there's woke capitalism, and there is the woke state because yeah. in the U.S. Yeah. 
they are changing the very basic of you know equality before the law. Uh, yeah. And so the, all those measures mean that it's not just capital; it's the state apparatus itself that is becoming, you know, uh, that is moving that direction. But so but I think this creates, yeah, but this creates an enormous arena for commons to actually appear, genuine yes. commons. I mean, I'm very hopeful in that sense, and that's why I love you, Michelle, and your work. I, I was involved with Burning Man for many years and participatory culture, so I've been on the more artistic side of things. It's the same things there. It's the commons again. It's communism in a way that works, even if it's temporary, it works. It's experimenting with trusting people you never thought you would trust, with creating trust between strangers, and all those things, and technologies to support that. I'm totally for that. And I think that, that a lot of beautiful things can happen this century. And I think, again, what we probably should call the tribal poesis. And tribal poesis is that something is born out of the collective. The collective does something and it's never been done before. It's a novel act. And today, the yeah. tribal poetically, somebody does something like your example, Rita Chanel in the coffee shops. If it's done somewhere, it can be done anywhere else. And that yeah. spreads like wildfire now because we now have what I would call the tribal best practice. If it tried yeah. anywhere, so it's, it's, it's viral. It's it's viral that works. Anybody else can do it too. Yeah. yeah, and 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 I think we should talk about protocolary organizations, right? That that's what is happening. So you have, you're doing something. You successfully have a protocol, a series of patterns, and they can then be emulated, and that creates like the family structure. So if if you accept those protocols, you're part of our tribe, basically. Yeah, and that's. I agree. And so that's one with Occupy and with 15 name, except that they couldn't last. They, they, you know, so we need, we need, and that's I think why we need economic tribes. We need to have social objects because that's, for me, that's what creates a commons. It's a common social object. And it's because we're doing and we love the same thing that certain property and governance arrangements are most appropriate for that particular social object in that particular community. Right? Would Michelle would would yeah. would would, N would NFTs have any role in this or no? Because I, I was reading an article recently about NFTs that the, that the future of social networks and digital communities will organize around digital objects that can sort of be, you know, um, I, I don't know the dynamics of the NFT enough to comment I, on. Do you have any idea about that? Yeah, maybe it's still my lingering uh, anti-capitalist side, but uh, yeah. basically it seems to me like a commodification of, of knowledge, yeah. and I don't really see what it what it can bring. You know I, what I has believe happened? more. Yeah, I believe more in. Uh, I call it reciprocity-based licensing. So you have copy left, you know, digital communism, but that means big corporations can use it as well, and and they have more money to compete with the small ones, or you can do copyright. And so you can't collaborate unless you have money and you buy the rights. I, th I, th I believe in something called copy fair, which says, okay, we continue to share the knowledge, but if you want to commercialize it, there is a reciprocity arrangement that you have to support the community and the commons. And the most simple way to do to that is, um, you know, you have a, a CC non-commercial, for the outsiders and you have a CC commercial for the insiders, right? So you have this, so I call this copy fair because I think it's probably slower than copy left because you, you know, don't get the massive investment of big multinationals in your system. But I think you can grow these kind of, you know, intermediary solidarity structures. Uh, anyway, that's, that's the way that I, 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 think I would just add that the NFTs are always bought by people who, who then buy them out of speculative reasons and, and think somebody else is going to value the NFT because nobody values the NFT. I mean, we just live in an age of mass duplication, period. It started with the printing press. We now have just escalated mass duplication. And if you cannot appreciate something unless you're the only owner of it, you're a fucking pervert. <laughs> right. I think that's the end of capitalism. That NFT is precisely the sort of phenomenon that happens today where the capitalists try to make something out of being they could then Delwood, but in reality, I've been in auction or NFT auctions to bring in money for good causes, philanthropy. You know, all the guys who pay for those NFTs yeah. and buy them, they, they, they just think they can buy them speculative reasons. So somebody else will buy it eventually. Yeah, and there's, the there's already that's websites where you can find the copies of all the NFTs. Is. So, you know, it's, yeah, it's like... just speculation booms, nothing else. It doesn't make any yeah. sense any longer. I, I, to have the original of something doesn't make sense because it was just built on a rivalry that no longer makes any sense to me. We live in a completely yeah, different I, I, I agree with that, and I'm happy we have the same reasoning on, on it. That's you know, great. I let, mean, let's, I, I, let's see. Let's see what happens with yeah. them. But so far, 
I was fundamentally skeptical of them, but I, I again, I just wanted to ask just because, you know, it would be, be interesting to get your guys' response to that. And it's, it's very confusing when you see a bunch of people in your network sort of getting very excited about NFTs and you don't really sort of un understand why they're getting excited about it or, or, or what it could bring to your own product pro products or something like that. They probably got excited product. about it because they thought, they thought they would make money out of it, but they didn't get excited to buy any NFTs. And if there's no buyer there, it's not going to be market. It's just like basic income, fantastic idea, totally for it, especially if it's negative taxation. I just want to know who's going to pay the bill. It's, it's I, artificial and, scarcity and before, <laughs> in an abundant medium, and that for me is fundamentally problematic. That's yeah, I agree with you. That's really good. That's a good yeah. argument. So a lot of these are just artists that could potentially that. happen. But they, they might not be happening for a, for a while yet. That's what we need to discuss as well. Eventually, that what what can happen? What, what's the timing? What's the timing here when something self-is, so Socratically speaking, can happen at a low cost and be very efficient? And when is it just too early? And it's just an interesting idea we need to keep for the future. Right. Yeah, well, I think that's a uh, just to 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 emphasize what you were sort of saying there, Michelle, because that's a that's. It's a really good, uh, almost a good quote: "Artificial scarcity in, a, in an abundant medium." Like that's that's a, that's a good way to to describe it. That makes that makes a lot of, a lot of sense to me. Um, maybe maybe uh, we can do a little bit of a, a roundup for the viewers about what what we've discussed here, and, and and maybe Michelle, what you would like people to take away, and maybe specifically uh, where people can um, get more involved in your work. I know you've released the the correct the Cosmo Local Reader, and that people can can sign up there for for future PDFs that you're going to be releasing as related to your projects. If, if maybe you want to go into that a little bit, right? So basically, I have a uh, wiki, um, which is wiki.p2pfoundation.net. And that's where I put everything. It's kind of my brain and, and some other people add on to it, but uh, has, you know, like 23,000 articles. And so basically think of anything and think commons and we will have it like uh, commons in education, commons in business, commons in funding, you know, it's, but also commons in spirituality and, and facilitation techniques and, uh, and everything. So that's, that's the wiki. And, and that's where I, you know, I do most of my work. I do also curation. So I spend four hours a day curating news about the commons and, you know, and, and opinion and interpretations and analysis. And I do that on Facebook, unfortunately. Uh, so there's a group called Open P2P. And yes, it's getting very toxic, uh, I know. But um, every time I try to change, I, you know, I lost 90% of my, of my uh, community. So I'm, I'm stuck there so, so far. Um, so that's where you can find things and, you know, just look uh, my name. And, and so I used to write a lot. I write a lot less now because I'm first I've been canceled in 2018 and it destroyed my income and it had, a, you know, I, I needed really time to recover from it. I, I was really personally uh, affected quite a bit. Um, and so right now I'm doing a kind of a personal project. I call it civilization analysis. And I'm basically trying to read all the macro historians. Uh, I know it oriented to the past, but I'm reading Spengler, Toynbee, Carl Quigley, uh, William Irving Thompson. And so the idea is to redo what I what I already did and that I sent you is this idea. Okay, have a good sense of world history and and the specific role of the commons at certain pivots in that history. That's what I'm ultimately aiming for, like to have a better grounding uh in in history um great. and for That's the rest great. of you know, i just continue to observe and to to think about what is happening and 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 i'm you know i'm very happy to be in your community because um there's so few spaces now where you can really speak out without being you know uh willfully mis misunderstood i would say <laughs> uh so that is uh that is great to have you know a place where people can think and make mistakes Yes, um, and still survive. Um, and where there's goodwill, you know, goodwill for the other person. That's great. Um, would you want to say one last thing about the Cosmo Local Reader? What is that? What can people expect when they sign up to the Cosmo Local Reader? Well, it's it's a book, and it's already finished. It's just we we need to finalize uh, little publishing uh, details. So it's a book with 40 case studies of people who are doing Cosmo Local production. So what I mean is relocalized production, 
combined with the global open design community and some form of fair organization, you know, co-op, social economy, solidarity economy, B corporations for benefit, whatever. So we look more at, at those kind, but, you know, can be small business as well. Um, so those three things, right? Local production, we, we talk about the, the subsidiarity of material production. You know, not not 100% localization, smart localization. Um, and so the idea is to have distributed manufacturing, producing on demand with biodegradable machine, biodegradable, uh, you know, raw material, um, and to drastically bring down the human footprint while maintaining a complex post-industrial society. That's the aim. Um, so it's an alternative both to neoliberalism and it's, you know, we spend three times more now on transport than on actually making things, and that's thermodynamically too expensive. Uh, but it's also kind of an answer to national protectionism, where you have all these nations competing with each other. Um, so I believe more in like bioregional localization uh, with cyber physical communities, where you have, you know, maker spaces, co working spaces, and they are both locally embedded community embedded but they also have their connection uh with the whole world the whole collective intelligence and then you have nomads that you know that fertilize uh all these different places by by moving around so that's kind of a vision <laughs> of a kind of neo medieval neo medieval common centric society it's like yeah. having the somewheres and the anywheres and the everywheres within the same community Together, absolutely. Yeah. I, okay, yeah. I, I want to just give you very fast examples. So this was a project in Ghent to do 100% organic food for public school students, 5 million meals a month. So you order the food from the organic farmers and promote the local economy. You have cargo bikes bringing it to the schools. You have the cooks again in the schools working with the families. And you have the geeks taking care of the digital infrastructure. So you bring together farmers, workers, precariat families and you recreate a social fabric of you know intellectual and physical work and i think this is where maker spaces are so interesting because you know this is post cartesian work they're no longer managers and workers they're people thinking about what they're doing designing it doing it and thinking well about what they've done and they're embedded in their community this is I think where we're going. This is this this is, this is the work. This is the this is what I and Cadell call tribal poiesis. Tribal poiesis. Yeah. Not other poiesis. Tribal poiesis. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Um, Bard, would you do you want to have any 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 last last words or thoughts for the for the viewers? No, I I I just admire Michelle deeply for the past over twenty five years. Uh, I think we're both sort of the derogates in the system, you know, pioneers, and, and we have students around the world who are discussing our work. And they're picking up gaps and they go off and do beautiful things. I think we agree on the premises here. So, absolutely. I'm a big supporter of Michelle's work and I highly recommend guys to check out. Thank you. Fantastic. And thank you, Kedel. Yeah, sure. You know, I'm, I have to say I'm happy with you as well because I was very interested in all these things, you know, Jung and, and, and Freud and all these things. And I was a Reichen, I lived in a Reichen community when I was in my 20s. You know, I went in the organ box and everything. <laughs> and and I, I noticed around me, nobody was speaking about these things anymore. And everybody's taking pills. Um, yes. And so I, I think we lost something. It's just, yes. you know, I, I, was, I was a suffering young man. And I was forced to work through my problems and become something more. And I really fear that this current culture, where as soon as you feel bad, you get some pill. And you lose motivation to work through it. And that's and I think that's what is creating the woke. You know, yes, that this I is, agree. This is what is creating the woke. I it's, agree. Oh, yeah. People have have they have an empty self, and yep. and so if if you're a conservative, you know you are you are somewhere, then you go back to your ethnicity, your nation state, your religion, right? My that was right, but but if you have no roots, then it's your skin color and your gender, My, and and I am. I suffer, you know, I am because I suffer. This is, this is like, it's the end of the Cartesian. Yeah. I think therefore I am. Now it's, yeah. I suffer because I am. And the yeah. thing is, yeah. don't, yeah. Don't, identi right? don't identify, don't identify with your suffering. And my response, 
my response to the woke has been to go deeper into psychoanalysis. So you're, I'm you're, so you're happy. In- I'm so happy you're doing this. This is like, yeah, absolutely. So, no. I mean, we, we we talked privately a little bit. We have a little bit of the same history, maybe probably different generations. And so there's a different response and so forth. But yeah, like my my response to the craziness of, of, of the identifications on the left has been to go deeper into un- trying to understand the unconscious. And I encourage everyone to sort of do their, it doesn't, it doesn't sort of matter what sort of ideological figure you focus on, but just to really go deeply into the unconscious. And I think that um, that there is an unconscious psyche and that it does play a role in political and economic organizations and that it it does have an, a material and, impact. And if you don't do shadow work, the only way you can see it is by projecting it on other people. And that is mm-hmm. what is happening now massively and it's a tragedy. Absolutely. Okay. So in this, in this distinction that you make in the paper between the left focusing on material and the right focusing on motivation, I would say that the synthesis is the unconscious because the unconscious is a type of material and the right wingers who focus on motivation do not pay attention to unconscious motivation. So I think that that's, that's, that's crucial. And, and I think that maybe my, the final thing I want to say before, before, before um, maybe ending this off is that um, the woke here is a pseudo attempt at the commons. Like what they, what they, they try to get a com they try to get a community through gender, through race, through false identifications, but that I think instead, it, that instead they create a lynch mob. That's what they do yeah, because yeah. the only way they can unify is by having an enemy they must attack. Exactly. That, that's why it's so destructive. Exactly. exactly. So I it's think it's not that, the commons at all. It's not the commons. It's exactly. It's, it's not it's a real not the commons. commons. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. It's not a commons, but if but if we can sort of think through deeply this this dialectical tension between uh, how Michelle was talking about the left and the right and sort of the problems of both this gen- this over identification with gender and race on the left. And on the other hand, this sort of uh, pseudo care for the commons on the right. I think we can think a, a real real commons. And from that process, we can become deeper individuals. We can become truer individuals. Um, and, and we can and we can build a type of, a, a qualitatively different type of world. Now we don't know what that qualitatively different type of world will look like yet, but I think it's conversations like this and people who are listening and also contributing to conversations like this where it will um, uh, hopefully emerge. Um, so so thank you so much, Michelle, for coming on and joining thank us. You. Of, of course, yeah, thank you for Alexander. Yeah, thank and you, thank Mark. you, Alexander, for 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 playing the the devil's advocate here with with some of Michelle's points. And uh, and uh, thank you all for for listening. So I'm gonna I'm gonna end the broadcast, and uh, hopefully the conversation will continue in other mediums. Uh, uh, sign up for the intellectual deep web, which is the community Michelle was talking about. Um, Bard, where can they get the contact for the intellectual deep web? Uh, they can find me on Twitter and Facebook and send a little message, okay. I think. But yeah. otherwise, intellectual deep web is a mailing list, so you need to get in contact with one of us, and then we add you to the list. Okay, so get in contact with either me or Bard, and we can add you to the intellectual deep web. Thank you again, Michelle, for joining, and uh, we're out of here. Hey.